Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending upon where you are today. Um, but uh, uh, first of all, uh, I think it's uh, been a great event so far, really uh, interesting and, and uh, overall great content. Um, I wanted to uh, take a moment and thank everyone for joining today's panel. Um, and uh, I'd also like to welcome uh, our esteemed panelists uh, to, to join the conversation. Um, I think as with all things going on right now, there's a lot of transformation and change, a lot of very interesting and uh, unique opportunities in the marketplace. Uh, I'm very excited to be hosting this panel uh, because we've got an interesting mix of folks. Uh, so uh, we're joined today uh, by Nicole, Allen, and Guy, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll actually have them introduce themselves in just a moment. But uh, you'll notice the, the interesting mix from a, I'll call it investor perspective, uh, an innovation and retail perspective, uh, as well as kind of broad-based market trends uh, that I think are, are very pertinent, both from a uh, overall Israel perspective perspective and, and also uh, in the day-to-day -day operations of, of various organizations. Um, and so uh, welcome everyone on the panelists' uh, side to join and, and looking forward to a great conversation around, uh, you know, trends in technology and in cyber and what's going on in the world. Um, I think uh, also just as a reminder to the audience members out there, uh, if you want to ask a question, there is the Q&A function uh, that's uh, uh, at the bottom of the screen uh, and uh, on the right-hand side uh, to be able to actually ask question of panelists. Um, we'll save some time towards the end of the conversation today uh, to make sure that we address some of those questions and, and really get a chance to make this interactive for everyone. Um, so I think maybe to start, um, what I'll ask is uh, if our panelists could introduce themselves uh, and actually share a, a project that you're working on right now that's particularly exciting uh, and in no uh, particular order only because uh, actually it's just how it shows up on my screen. Alan, uh, I'll ask you to go first uh, and, and I think uh, kind of from the, uh, you know, innovation side as well as digital side for H&M, uh, you know, if you could share a little bit of um, your role, what you're working on, and, and really give us a sense, you know, what's a, what's a cool project you're working on right now? Uh, and Alan, you are actually on mute. There we are. I'm sorry. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and join you guys once again. Um, you know, I, my name is Alan Bain. I'm the, uh, the CTO for the H&M Group. Uh, H&M is one of the largest fashion retail uh, companies in the world uh, with, with uh, stores in, in excess of 70, 70 countries. Um, I joined in, in July after a few years at P&G and a few years at Coca-Cola before that and a number of other companies. Uh, coming into a, to a company during a pandemic is, is very interesting. Coming into a company in a pandemic that's based in Europe when you're stuck in the United States makes it even more interesting. So I'm, I'm now working evening hours in the U.S. Uh, so I can be on Swedish time in uh, for the rest of the company. But I, so as we're going through our transformation, I think H&M went through an amazing expansion for, for a number of years, going from very few stores to over 5,500 stores today across all of our brands in all these different countries. And of course, prior to the pandemic, um, the majority of that was in store. Our purchases were in store, although we had a, an online presence. Now, we've always been working towards an omni-channel environment, uh, which is very important to us, as always has been, to meet our customers wherever we are. We're a very, very customer-centric organization, but the pandemic had to speed everything up, as, as you can imagine. So our, our challenges right now are the continuation of both expansion from a physical as well as a online state, uh, really pursuing the, the customer-centric approach that we're known for. We're moving... And at the same time, we've been moving forward over the last few years on a, on a platform of sustainability and a platform of, of, of a social responsibility and, and modifying where, we, where our roots were, which was in sort of the fast fashion industry. So that adds another layer of, of technological change. And before I joined, the company had also made the decision that it wanted to move into becoming more of an engineering organization and not just a, a purchaser of technology services. So all of these changes provide a, a unique opportunity, not just to impact H&M, but impact the industry as a whole. And that's why I joined and, and, and any, any type of technology and, and our capability that supports those is things that we're looking at and building a strategy around and starting to execute against. Very cool. I can imagine just the challenge of uh, not only, you know, not being able to sleep because if you're working, you know, both country hours, but also you probably haven't met many of your colleagues just because the, the borders are still closed, you know, in person, you're, you're not able to get out there. No, I, I haven't been able to, uh, to get to Sweden since early last year, about a year ago this time. Um, and uh, I'm 
I'm keep plotting my way to get there. And then of course, uh, the vaccine distribution in the United States is, is uneven at best is what we can say. Uh, and I plan to uh, be over there and, and relocate uh, for a period of time as, as soon as I can. Uh, hopefully soon. Um, Nicole, uh, same question for you. Perhaps if you could take a moment, introduce yourself, give us a little bit of your history and background. Um, and also what, what's an exciting project you're working on? What's something that's very much top of mind for you? Ooh, hard to pick on that last one, um, but I'll start with the introduction. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Priel. It's an honor to be here with the group and thank you for having me. I'm a partner with IBEX Investors. For the last 17 years, we've been investing in a multitude of strategies, um, both in the US and overseas. So we're a multi-stage and multi-strategy firm. That means we invest in public companies and private companies in the US and globally. And I lead our early stage Israel fund where we're looking to back the most promising seed and series A founders across all sectors. So we've been incredibly active in Israel for the last 10 years and we've stepped that up dramatically in the past 12 months or so. Um, so I'm speaking to you from Tel Aviv. Um, we work incredibly closely with our portfolio companies and really try to help them bridge the gap from Israel to the United States and globally where their ultimate markets lay. Um, to that end, we're working on a very exciting project, putting together a world-class advisory board comprised of C-level executives in certain functions who can advise us as investors and work closely with our portfolio companies in their domains and areas of expertise. So if you're a CISO, we would pair you with our cybersecurity companies. If you're a CMO, you can help our um, our companies on inbound marketing or outbound strategy. So, so that's a, a big value add for us and for our portfolio companies. And we're very excited about putting that together. We're about halfway through. Very cool. Uh, and Guy, uh, I know you join us from DTCP, which, uh, as we all now know, stands for Deutsche Telekom Capital Partners. Maybe share a little bit of uh, your background history and, uh, and what's that one cool thing that's, that's on your plate right now? Sure. So DTCP used to stand for Deutsche Telekom Capital Partners uh, when we raised our second fund 2018. That's already a multi-LP fund. That means we have more than one investor. Um, and we basically went with the acronym, which also stands for Digital Transformation Cloud and Platforms, which is what we focus on. That makes perfect. Of course it does, right? Um, so we're a growth fund. Um, and we have the German roots, as you uh, alluded, but we also have a very strong Israeli presence. We have a partner on the ground and a nice team. And we're basically here in the U.S. Uh, Bay Area. I mean, Palo Alto, our office is, you know, for whenever that matters, it's Menlo Park. Uh, so we cover the entire kind of Western hemisphere and we try to think of ourselves as uh, value adding in two ways. Uh, first, I mean, capital, everyone's got money these days. We invest right now in the growth stages where the big money talks and valuations are crazy, as you know. So uh, we differentiate by being able to open doors and kind of facilitate relationships uh, and business engagements across the world, but specifically Europe where we have a very good uh, network of uh, enterprises and, co and corporates that we uh, uh, foster. Um, and we also uh, work with the CEOs and CFOs on their numbers, because numbers really matter at the growth stages. So we're able to, uh, we, we collect data uh, from hundreds of companies. And by data, we mean dozens of different indicators and specific numbers that we can benchmark and compare and use AI I know it's a, it's a big word, but we actually have a platform. So the biggest project we have right now is productizing that to the extent that not only us in the fund will be able to benefit from being able to benchmark and compare and figure out what's wrong and what's right, but also make that available to the CEOs and, and the CFOs of the portfolio companies. So think of it as a, as a portal, as an interface for a technology company to know where they're at and how they benchmark and, and compare against the rest of the, their peers. So that's our biggest project for the year, other than fundraising, of course. Um, that's a really interesting idea. I think, you know, it's something that's always come up. I'm curious, what type of indicators are most important for you as you look at that? So as growth investors, we were always very obsessed with efficiency and all the efficiency sure. metrics, you know, how much you're spending versus how much you're gaining from it on all different, uh, different uh, accounts in France. Uh, I should say, Honestly, that the market has really taken an interesting direction where the only thing that really matters is growth. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the world is now a big money kind of seller's world. So everyone 
who has the growth is able to get the high valuations and the nice uh, round dynamics. Within that, we're still able to figure out what drives growth. So expansions versus um, you know, new logos, for example, which is very important. And we can actually identify issues or advantages that the company has in being able to sell more into its customer base. So yeah, we, we still focus a lot on the um, efficiency indicators and growth within a customer. But overall, I think that's that's where the world is going. Growth, growth, growth. So it, it's, always, I mean, look, it's, it's not exactly anything different than any of the indicators that I think every investor looks at, right? But but what, what I, I think is interesting, and you, you kind of hit the head on something, it's, it's a question that I want to pose to Alan, because I wonder to what extent those KPIs are aligned with the way that, Alan, you think about bringing innovation into the company, right, from an external source. Obviously, there's the internal innovation stuff you're doing, and, and I do want to hear more about that soon. But, you know, when you look at adopting a technology, you know, let's say it's one of Guy's portfolio companies or Nicole's or one of ours, right, what are the things that are most important for you? Uh, you know, and, and I think some of those I'm imagining are, you know, check boxes that have to be hit to say, yes, these, this is credible and real, but you know, what, what is the differentiator at that KPI level that really separates out, you know, the winner from the loser, the company that can do business with an H and M or a Coca-Cola or a PNG or whoever compared to, uh, you know, the one that doesn't get that shake. Well, I, I think, you know, you know, these and I've talked before, um, not, not all technology is equal. Not all companies are the same. And, and, and certainly not all divisions or, or problems in a company is the same. So, so what I like to, to look at is if something is truly a differentiator and it's gonna give me an, a, a, a sustainable, and sustainable can be a six months or a year, but a sustainable competitive advantage um, for a period of time, I'm gonna to tend to go with somebody that's very early stage, very, very early stage. And I'm gonna take the risk because it's so unique and as part of my negotiations, I'm not going to let them work with my competitors for a period of time because I'm, I'm not going to allow the knowledge transfer for me to be used against me. In other areas where I have startups where it is much more commodity driven, quite honestly, the startups are competing against the big guys because it is a commodity and, and, and price and capability and support and consistency matter much more. And, and those areas that are between those two, a lot of it gets down to speed, agility, ability to solve how quickly things can get implemented, but also how much of global support they can provide. I recently had a discussion with one company in the e-commerce space and through through one, one venture fund and, and the fund said, you really need to talk to these people. And I said, well, here's the deal. I, I do have a need. I said, this company has been around for about eight, nine months. I said, you tell them if they can't support X number of languages, if they can't support 24 by seven in all these different countries, they get one shot with me and otherwise they're blackballed forever. Do they really want to approach me on this now? Are they ready to do it? Are they ready to scale? Or do they, should they think twice? And you know, they I feel like there's a lot of this too, right? And, and I think there's something that, you know, and I, I don't know if you're seeing it, Nicole and, and Guy as well, but as I look at the reputation associated with particular execution, um, all it takes is one mistake. Right. You have to have, from your point, guy, you know, 10 growth, uh, you know, 15 logos, you know, all this like wonderful things have to go right. But it's all it takes is one mistake to kind of tank the reputation. Right. Like uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, listen, we'll never do business again together. And, you know, Godspeed and good luck. But, um, Alan, I'm sure you talk with your peers on a regular basis. And I'm sure these things come up from time to time. Right. So, you know, it, it's tough. Uh, it's tough to do it right. I think you have to remember if something happens really good and it's positive, you usually tell one person when something <laughs> happens negative, you figure it's, it's going to be multiplied by three or five. That's right. Uh, and, and I imagine Nicole, that's probably some of the purpose that you have around building out, you know, this kind of advisory board and some of the things that you're working on. Right. So um, what are the trends that you're using to kind of guide the direction you're looking at? You know, obviously there are multiple different sectors, I'm sure. Uh, it sounds like, you know, CISO, CIO, CMO being very, very kind of particular ones, you know, from a, a technology and adoption perspective. Um, what, what's coming next? 
Like, how do we as an industry and, and maybe just as a, a collection of folks in a, a Zoom room on a panel think about uh, what is that, you know, kind of next place to skate to? How do we get to where the puck will be, not where it is today? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's that's low. If, if you can tell that, I got yeah, billions for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a really good uh, it's a really good question. That's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, more and more, and this this might be quite granular, but it just it's I think it's a trend um, that we're seeing a lot, and I think it could expand to other categories and sectors. When it comes to technologies that are sold to the CISO or to the CIO, we're seeing increased involvement from DevOps. And I think that this is the beginning of a multi-year trend um, that is just, uh, it's gonna compound and it's gonna mean a whole lot of different things for, for early stage companies who are looking to sell into enterprises. So that's something that we're beginning to grapple with and trying to understand how to best navigate. So I think more and more, parts of the organization that typically or historically didn't rely on DevOps to run POCs or to do integrations are now forced with that, um, forced with that. And, and those, uh, those groups don't always get along so well. Um, so the questions for us are, what does this mean? Will vendors uh, now have to kind of um, sell themselves on painless integration? Will they have to look for shared budgets across what is perhaps the security and the DevOps functions and, and so on and so forth. What does this mean for serverless? Is serverless adoption gonna rise because developers are wielding more power? Um, so, so that's just an example of something where, where we're thinking two, three, five, ten 10 years ahead because it's, it's starting to affect us now. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I, I, there's so many, there's always this lagging indicator. Every organization still has like an infrastructure team, right? But like infrastructure, it doesn't mean anything anymore if you're going to the cloud. It eventually will become a, a subsumed process as a function of DevOps. And I think, um, you know, I have particularly strong views on what I'll call the serverless side of the world. I think it's a great way to get locked into a vendor, like the, the whole point of the moving to the cloud and having a microservices architecture and leveraging Kubernetes and containers and everything else is to try and not lock yourself in. And so I think this is that effort of trying to, you know, kind of force people into it. Um, but I, I am I'm, you know, curious to see because it does pose a problem from a, a portfolio, you know, kind of or a, a small startup perspective, selling into an organization when you might have, you know, I'll call it the the purse strings belong to an infrastructure side, but the actual, you know, uh, implementer or the team that is really behind using it is going to be DevOps. Um, and there might be a year or two lag in between those things actually coming to bear. Um, Alan, I, within your organization, how far have you gone down de the, uh, the DevOps path? Um, you know, what is kind of the consideration uh, for, or what advice would you give? What advice would you give to those who have that DevOps enabled capability? How do you cross those multiple different disciplines effectively um, without creating turf wars and fiefdoms and, and issues? So I think you have to look at any, any large you know, company with a history. And, 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 and yeah, I think DevOps was developed uh, and the concept of DevOps and microservices, I, it goes to me, it goes back to the days of Netflix and then Adrian Apthorpe and let me put that team together. And it was, it was then moved on from company to company. But you have to remember that those were all digital businesses. And the reality is that most corporations are not 100% digital. And you have different archetypes of, of systems that you have to deal with. And, and therefore, DevOps is, is very good for new things. DevOps is certainly much easier to do for some customer facing things. But many of us uh, around the world are still burdened by large ERP implementations that have a lot of, of, of history and process involved. And, and I, I've been looking for the last six months to somebody that can actually show me how you can effectively do DevOps on, on an SAP system. It's just, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, how, so, how do you do agile with your ERP? Like, I mean, the reality is you don't, you don't want to, you want it to be as stable as possible, right? Exactly, but that means though is you have to then redefine what the ERP is, and the ERP is for stable processes. Which, which going back to my earlier discussion, means you don't use an ERP for competitive advantage, and it, you use it for for very best uh, best in class type of activities. So, I, I think that there's you know you look at any large company that, that I've been with, I would say you maybe get 10, 20 percent are, are, are DevOps available. Uh, the rest of these things are are buried in others. Now we still need to be agile. 
in, in, in ERP systems, you need to be agile in other ways, maybe do mini waterfall, maybe do other things, but, but you certainly aren't going to be like a, a pure digital company. And that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, I think, it, let me shift gears for a moment because I, I, you know, Nicole, you use the term DevOps and we've used the term DevOps now multiple times over the course of this conversation, but um, there is a term that I think has replaced DevOps that we did not mention, which is really the DevSecOps consideration. So um, Guy, are you doing things in the security world? I would imagine anybody related to anything having uh, even a, a glimmer of, of, you know, relationship to Israel is somehow in some fashion or another doing things in cyber and whatever that means as a market map. But, uh, you know, when when you look at the security world, what are the major trends you're seeing? What are you kind of looking towards and um, what are your, your concerns or your, your opportunity? Right, so we, uh, we actually overweighted uh, cyber. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. I think cyber uh, will remain an opportunity because the threats are just growing, not just in size and magnitude, but also um, in uh, severity. So things are actually getting more acute closer to home, you know, we see a lot of uh, right now phishing attacks across our portfolios even, and of course our own firm. Um, and there's a limit to what uh, security professionals, security uh, practitioners can do with the existing tools and technologies. So the next generation of cyber, you mentioned SecDev Ops. So the operational side of it is very important. And we focus a lot there. And obviously part of that is automation. Thing. The, the shifting left of things also means that many of the things that you used to do manually will be done automatically, and many of the things that you used to do yourself will be somehow outsourced either, either to human beings or robotic processes that will figure out stuff before you're even able to, to know that something went wrong. So a lot of our focus today is trying to identify, and again, we go by, by numbers, right? Companies that are actually doing well, we do not need to double click on the technology before we figure out this company is actually doing things right. And we have invested quite a lot uh, over the past year in companies that are taking this uh, notion of automation and outsourcing to the next level. So what we call MDR, managed detection and response. And we invest in a company called Arctic Wolf that basically completely offloads your entire kind of tier one um, uh, SOC work uh, and does that for you and does it very well. And we've uh, looked at the IoT world and threats that are coming through other types of, of devices, not necessarily your typical network infrastructure. Um, and that's going to be a big thing for us uh, in the coming years. So just to, to finish that thought, automation. CISOs, heads of security for organizations, will tell you the one thing they have too little of is time. Right, they don't have time to respond, and they don't have time to. They don't even have time to respond to all the vendors. One CISO told me once. I asked him, "What well, what kind of feature or product would you want?" He said, "I need a firewall to keep the emails of the vendors out of my inbox." I so, actually know a few CISOs. What they did is they just don't accept any external email. Exactly right, but that's obviously not a, uh, a scalable strategy if you want to innovate. So uh, if you're able to help those CISOs automate those processes and offload some of that. Um, I think that's where the money is and that's where our investment is going to be. Uh, Nicole, I guess same question for you. So the cyber landscape, um, what are you looking at? What do you think is a, a big area? Obviously, Guy has his uh, predisposition towards, I'll call it, you know, SOC and automation. I agree. Um, I do always worry that automation can often be a race to the bottom rather than actually, you know, taking things off of people's plates. But it's, it's a recipe for disaster, especially if the attackers start to get a little bit more sophisticated, right? But um, when you look at, you know, your portfolio, you look at the direction that you're kind of driving towards, what are the, the key kind of uh, trends in cyber that are important? Yeah, so I would I would focus on two. One is a domain, and for us, that's cloud and Kubernetes security. So we're actually on our third cloud security company. The first two successfully exited. Uh, we made a third investment in the space early last year, and it's proven to be um, a, a good bet. So, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the conversation about Kubernetes and microservices, the world is headed in that direction, and it's already there in many ways. So we're doubling down on that bet. And further to your point about um, kind of alert fatigue, I think a lot of security organizations are telling us, hey, you know what? We're drowning in alerts. Really just show us the top, top 10, show us the top 20 cops. We don't wanna see 600 alerts. We have no way to tackle that. Let's just focus on what's really important. 
and and the visibility as well that comes along um, with just understanding what a network looks like. The complexity is is vast, and being able to map network dependencies and understand attack path vectors can provide a lot of value um, to CISOs and their teams. So, so to sum up, we really like cloud security. That that need is only growing, and we we really like you know, giving CISOs back their time and giving them the visibility that they desperately are looking for. Alan. Actually, well, well, sorry, sorry, before Alan speaks, one more thing, and maybe I'll ask Alan to relate to that if that's okay. Um, one of the other aspects of security that is not typically dealt with is what happens to your content or your interaction with your customer, think H&M, for example, from the moment that bit leaves your servers until it's consumed by the end user, and, and back, right? So it could be your uh, interaction, your uh, purchases, uh, anything you see on your screen, mobile or, or uh, PC, uh, what is the consumer getting? And is that real? Is that something that is potentially dangerous for them? I think many brands are uh, waking up to the realization that what they're serving and what's being consumed by the consumer or by the user are two very different things. So one area we're focused on trying to find uh, solutions in is how to defend that customer journey from the moment it leaves your custody or care as a provider until it's you know, successfully consumed or completed by the user. And we have made two investments in that space, but we're still very open and looking for additional ones. It's an interesting problem um, there are, you know, a number of attacks that have kind of manifested in, I'll call it the man in the browser technique, the, you know, hijacking, uh, form jacking, uh, various different kind of things that I, I think, you know, everybody's really looking at trying to, to solve because the experience does get co-opted. Uh, you know, the, the challenge, of course, is, you know, making sure that brand is not impacted, but then you've got compliance regulations, GDPR, you've got, you know, all kinds of things that look really bad on the other side of it. Um, I, I often wonder, you know, some of these flaws, I think, are, are going to get fixed. Uh, so I wonder if it's a long-term investment strategy or if it's a short-term one where next couple of years, three years, five years, at what point does, you know, the W3C realize that, like, you know, JavaScript is just not a good language and, like, we need to put some stuff around it that stops it from being co-optable or, you know, things that are really in kind of redefining the way that, you know, we work with technology, right? Um, so I mean, I think the, the bad guys are getting better and better well, at what and, they do, right? But and again, it's that question of are we skating to where right? the puck is or are we skating to where it will be? And, and I, I don't, I'm not, if I had the answer again, I'd be, you know. It's a longer session, maybe a two day conference just on this topic. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, Alan, I, what I wanted to do was kind of ask you from a prioritization perspective. So, you know, automation, alert fatigue, uh, you know, the ability to, to kind of find the needle in the, the needle stack. Uh, some of the conversations that I think are really around innovation in the world of security. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, are maybe taking off your H&M hat for a moment, because it's always a little dicey when we talk about, you know, security in an existing company, but you're, you're a broad-based expert in this field as well. So when you look at the market, you know, and you think about what are people not doing or thinking enough about uh, from a security perspective, where is that, you know, skate to where the puck will be moment? What do you think there's not enough energy and attention being spent on? Um, well, I think you know, what's, what's sort of interesting in going company to companies they have, is the number one area where you can get the biggest value and, and nobody, it's not sexy, so nobody wants to deal with it, is just basic hygiene. Patching. <laughs> hygiene. <laughs> Patching and other things. I mean, if you get the basics right, if you don't have the basics right, it doesn't matter what new advanced technology you put on top of it, you're still, you're still vulnerable. Yeah, and and you corporations in general. No door, like, you know, or you left the window wide open, like what's the point, you know? Exactly, and this could be things as simple as if your, you know, if your Wi-Fi uh, connect connections or Bluetooth connections are penetrating the outside of your building, and somebody can come in and hop onto that. I mean, that's a problem. If you don't patch your systems, that's a problem. There's just so many basics that corporations don't take care of, and especially if you get into the mid-market companies. You know, there is, that's the real opportunity, but it's not sexy. It's not new. It's not going to be that next billion dollar business. Nobody, nobody wants to come up with new ways to deal with that because you can't sell it to investors. Yep. Hey, I've got a better way to patch a system. I've got a better way to, to block out Wi-Fi. I mean, 
but that's what's needed. And, and, I, I, and that, that's a huge market opportunity. I literally talk day in, day out with CIOs and CISOs and CTOs, like literally back to back all day. And it's always the same answer, which is like, we just need to do our fundamentals better. When you look at like 80 or 90% of, you know, major breaches, it's always the, the patching aspect. It's the, you know, we just, we didn't, you know, enforce a password policy or, you know, mm-hmm. something silly, right? And I feel like, you know, again, and, and I'll, I'll, you know, reframe the earlier thing I said, like, you have to be right every time when you're defending and when you're an attacker, you just have to be right once, right? Like it is truly asymmetric warfare. So, you know, what I find, and, and I think, is a good point if, and, and for the innovators and the entrepreneurs and the people out in the audience who are listening um, you know reality is I think all of these investors are always looking for what's that new fancy you know shiny gadget um, but if there was some way to fix the fundamentals better I think there's a lot more value in that right now now whether that's six months from now a year from now my guess is it'll probably still be consistent but I would imagine that's a good lesson that's a takeaway um, there is one interesting thing though right so you know for all of the fundamentals of of um, patching uh, and, you know, these security aspects that we've talked about that are just good hygiene. Um, it's what makes attacks like the solar winds attack kind of so nefarious, right? You know, the, the concept that um, somehow or another, uh, somebody got into the software supply chain within the organization and then, you know, basically pushed out a bad patch or enabled a bad patch to be, you know, delivered. So those who were diligent and patched and were able to actually get everything, you know, kind of up to speed, they were the ones who were most adversely affected. So I'm curious for, for Guy, Nicole, uh, are you guys looking at all all around what I'll call, you know, fixing the supply chain security, uh, software supply chain security life cycle. Is there, you know, how do I, how do I build trust back into that? Like, how do we stop the next solar wind style attack from happening? And frankly, it's not like it's brand new, right? This is exactly where the, the same attack happened before with uh, not Petia and, you know, took down a major pharmaceutical company, you know, for, for a long time, right? So how do we stop the untrusted patch problem are you looking at that space are there innovation and startups that you're you're kind of evaluating nicole do you want to start i can definitely take the first crack at it so uh so so at the time two years ago three years ago it was very popular to talk about the code and how do you secure the code so down to the uh development environment of, of the developer how do you actually while the code is being generated or created you identify the holes and potential uh, risks in there. It, th- there's a whole a category that formed around that. One of the companies in that particular category just uh, raised money at a very high valuation. Everyone is very proud of that SNCC, obviously. Um, so I think that's Gen 1. Uh, and Gen 2, I go back to my automation uh, point. I think a lot of that can be automated. I mean, unlike the areas where you say, hey, because of automation, we might be missing out on some of the more intricate stuff. Here, it's pretty straightforward, right? The, 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 the form information of code is such that allows you to automate a lot of those processes. Um, the other uh, thing which I think is connected to the DevOps movement is where exactly are those vulnerabilities? Who's creating them? Who's, who's basically in charge of making sure they're, they're uh, patched and pegged before they become risks? And we see a lot of the testing world actually kind of collide and coincide with that. So see many of the uh, next generation testing companies actually look at security testing at scale. Again, the automation and, and here AI would play a, a very big part. So we're actually looking for companies um, that have been able to address the security testing with the automation part of it at scale. We made one such investment, but again, as I said, we're o- always open to look at the next generation and the, and the, uh, the best company out there. It's almost like a way to validate hygiene or patch patch validation or software, like an extra step. And, and what's really interesting for me is it's so at odds with, for example, the Microsoft vulnerability. And it just seems like every week there's something brand new and terrible that ends up happening that is really kind of difficult. So if you think of kind of the context for a, you know, Microsoft patch uh, issue, right, um, by having this zero day open by, for even a day or two, all of these broadcast, you know, attacks that end up happening on the exchange server mean that you have to patch as quickly as possible. 
But then take that, you know, if you had patched really quickly with solar winds, there was an organization that I, I shall re remain nameless where the CISO told me we avoided the solar winds patch uh, because, you know, or, or the solar winds attack because we hadn't patched in, you know, basically like six months, right? So like that's also bad, but for a different reason. And how do you validate the in-between? To me, that's going to be a big space. Right. Uh, Nicole, I assume you're getting involved in this space as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, here in Israel, where there's almost more cyber startups than there are people. You can't walk down the street without running into like four cyber startup uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Yeah, you're kidding me. We're actually in a building in a, like a four block radius where I think 90% of them are concentrated. So, so it's quite accurate. Uh, we're certainly looking into the space. Uh, we've seen a couple opportunities come up and, and we're, are, we are eager to invest uh, in, into this trend. Absolutely. Alan, is there just too many cybersecurity startups at this point? Like, honestly, it feels overwhelming to me. Like, and, and it seems like there's a, just room for consolidation. Like, and, and I imagine, you know, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that consolidation ends up being a very watered down, you know, version, right? Uh, you start to get, I, I won't, you know, kind of compare Palo Alto to becoming the, the new CA, you know, where, where good software goes to die, because I don't think they are, right? But at the same token, like the more of this consolidation that happens, it seems like a negative, And yet, there's just too many cybersecurity startups, in my opinion. So how do you deal with that inundation? So, so I think, I think as you know, I, mean, I have, a, I've spent a lot of time working with the venture community, and I started the bridge program with Gabby in, in, in Tel Aviv, and, 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 and um, so spent a lot of time, have a lot of good friends. But you know, and, and said, please, I hope the investors there don't take this wrong, but, but you know, a lot of investors suffer from shiny object syndrome. And, you know, I, I've talked to many corporations and, and corporations end up acting like squirrels and squirrels chase shiny objects. And, and so it, it, feeds the, it feeds the venture community very well to be putting as many shiny objects out there as they are. The, the reality is that corporations cannot ingest very many new technologies and new capabilities a year. Now, financial institutions aside, technology companies aside, they're, they're just com completely different beasts. And having been with a financial institution and tech company, I can, I can say that. But the, the reality is you can't, you can't ingest that much. Um, although the, the um, consolidation may seem bad on the outside, from a business contractual standpoint, from an operation standpoint for a corporation, it makes life a lot easier because you don't have to manage all of the different pieces. Doesn't mean you're any safer in security. You may even be less safe because once you have a vulnerability in one, as we saw with what happened with SolarWinds with, 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 with Microsoft, it, it permeates across everything. But, and there still is a value to layered approaches, but there are just too many different choices out there that don't make a significant difference for the amount of operational inefficiency that it introduces to a large corporation. So you know, what, I want, out. what I want is, is not a company that's going to consolidate, but a company that's just going to be agnostic and come actually implement these things appropriately, because you're absolutely right. I think there's just so many shiny objects and, and frankly, it solves a need, but then it's like, okay, move on to the next shiny object. And, you know, now it never was operationalized. Right. So I think there's space for, more services firms, which I know investors generally never really want to kind of put time and energy towards, but like to come in and just get this stuff to work. I got to say something here. Uh, we are, you're right. I mean, we don't like services companies, but if you're able to render a service at scale based on a product that either you've built or integrated, this is a win, right? Sure. So the ability to offer something that looks custom and kind of white glove to the customer, but he's actually productized and automated to a large extent. I think sure. that's the whole, that's the whole. I, I sense a theme with you on automation. I feel like that's definitely the. Again, right, I, 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 I believe in machines, you know, humans are not very dependent. Humans are imperfect. Machines are perfect. Um, let's move off of security. I think we've got about uh, another 15 minutes left. Um, before I, I do that though, I'll, I'll remind the audience again, um, there are certainly uh, questions. I know I've got a couple up here and I'll, I'll get to those in a moment, but do feel free if you do have questions for our esteemed panelists, um, by all means, happy to uh, jump into those. Um, I want to shift back to what I'll call really kind of the innovation ecosystem. Alan, you've done a phenomenal job at every organization you go to establishing this kind of innovation, you know, funnel, this supply and 
curve, if, you know, where do we look for innovation from the market and how do we identify innovation opportunities within the organization? Um, it's always going to be, I'm sure, a challenge to get that cultural uh, kind of switch to happen. But for you, what are those secrets to success? How do you drive innovation? What are the key metrics you use um, to say we're in the right direction? We are innovating. We are going, you know, down the right path. I, I used to joke around and I would say it depends on the number of cocktail parties you go to. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, not but, anymore. <laughs> not anymore. But, but I can tell you that the number of events that offer virtual wine for you to attend is amazing. My, uh, I don't need to restock my wine cellar for, for a year now. Um, I, I, I think that you know, I, you know, innovation happens anywhere and everywhere in the world. We, do, we just have to accept it. And, and I, I think the key to success that I found is basically to follow the money and see where the investors are. Because if the investors are putting risk capital in, there's a better opportunity and a better chance that those areas are going to expand and, and they're going to grow. However, saying that, we're seeing certain specialties in, of, of technological specialties coming up in certain areas where you wouldn't expect before for them to occur. So somehow you have to blanket blanket the world. I, I think you have to pick a, a theme for yourself. Um, I, I've been talking for a number of years about uh, the move to the edge, probably five or six years. Uh, I still hear people talking about the cloud. Um, I'm not going to say the cloud is dead, but I think the cloud is old. And, and, and I think what we're going to start seeing is more meshed approaches to, uh, to both analytics, meshed approaches to networking, meshed approaches to everything. And, and that's going to take us back to where we were 20 years ago when we started first doing distributed computing or 25 years ago. So there's a, somebody that I met many years ago, a friend of mine, Alan Cohen, and another gentleman named Irving Moldowski Berger, who was at IBM, and, and they put together a, a, a discussion on back to the future. And what we need to do is just look backwards to see where the future is going to be, because it's, that, that's what happened. Virtualization was a mainframe technology, right? Like realistically, it, it, you know. It, it, it's exactly, and, and so we, we can see this. We, we start talking about contextual networks that actually goes back to work that was done in Xerox Park 20 years ago. So. The, if we if we learn from history, we can predict the future. Then we can apply that to those business problems for our corporations that mean have the most opportunity to advance. And the challenge we have as corporations is our competitors of tomorrow are not the competitors of today. That although uh, although we've seen these shifts, I, the major changes in various industries have been driven by people that are not even in those industries. Whether, whether it's what's happened with, with cars coming from, from, uh, from Tesla, which basically called Elon a, a software provider to what's happened to the space industry there. Netflix basically changing entertainment forever. You start looking at these things. So the question is, where is that next change coming from? And understanding who are those innovators that can help you get to what's next as opposed to just incremental improvement. I think you actually bring up a good point, which is, you know, in fact, innovation often comes from people who are not in that sector, right? The people who said, why is this this way, rather than the people who said, oh, this is this way because it's always been this way. Um, you know, if I look at, and obviously these are the disruptors, you know, that we always kind of talk about, but like Uber and Netflix and others that, you know, really it, it was just an, a moment in time to say, yeah, why don't we just do it this way instead? But I have no idea why we've been doing it, you know, why that was established, right? So I, I also think innovation is one of those simple concepts. I, I love to talk about the, the ketchup bottle. You know, it wasn't until this kind of, you know, valve that was created for a completely different industrial function that had nothing to do with food. Somebody realized that, like, you know, the, the thing that people don't like about ketchup is that there's that icky, like, you know, watery stuff on top. And the only way to fix that is to turn the bottle upside down. You know, they went through millions of dollars of innovation and in trying to figure out, you know, how do we, you know, change the bottle size? How do we do, you know, they literally went through everything and said, you know what, they, they looked at formula. They looked at, like, you know, every possible aspect, but just said, actually, if we just turn it upside down, that'll fix the problem, right? So I think those simple answers become really valuable too. I, I think they're simple and being able to take them across industry. I mean, as you know, I, I do angel investing and other things. And, and, and I originally saw an Israeli company that is, put, is, is putting biomarkers into plants and really creating IoT plants. And that just fascinated me. And, and so I've, I've started to get involved with that. And I, I know nothing about plants, but I know about IoT. And I thought, this, now, what else can I what else can I learn about this approach to this to changing genetics and how does that impact other things? The same thing with quantum and security. I've been doing things in quantum and security. I've been doing things looking at patches that can detect uh, DNA, uh, can detect uh, uh, coronavirus. But but all of these things come together by having an inquisitive mind 
And then the question is, how do you apply it in other areas where it hasn't been applied before? And how can you help these entrepreneurs with your vast different experiences, help them grow the companies to create better opportunities for everyone? Just, just so long as we stay away from the whole Jurassic Park concept of never asking the question of you know, whether we could and start asking questions of whether we should. I'm not entirely sure why we put IoT in plants, but I, 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 can, gain, I can guess you know, kind of a directionality, but yeah. Um, it's, it's what she actually has some, the founder has some wonderful ideas and some things that are gonna really change, change the food chain. I, I can, yeah, food chain, crop production. I'm sure there's a reason. I, I get the concept, but I also I always <laughs> wonder at what point we play God. Um, so I, I think um, one of the elephants in the room is the fact that we are not sitting on a panel in person together somewhere, that we are not physically located. On the one hand, frankly, it's great because otherwise, Nicole, you'd be, you know, uh, have to fly all the way across the country or uh, across the world to get to this country when you're, you're there. And Alan, you'd have to fly all the way across the country or, or maybe we do it in California or whatever the case may be. But the point is, um, we're currently in a virtual world. And we had this kind of moment in time where there was this, you know, black swan event. Um, this hopefully is a once in a lifetime occurrence and there will not be another pandemic as far as we know, but reality is it's highly possible. Um, I think we're adapted for that, but what about the next thing, right? Um, how can you address the uncertainty? Uh, are there particular, you know, strategies of future proofing against this unknown, unknown, major catastrophic world event um, that, you know, either are, you know, from a risk reward perspective that maybe you're looking at saying, hey, we're not going to invest in that area because it's too rigid. You know, maybe that's, I'll call it office space, or maybe that's, you know, um, uh, strategies that are, are too, too kind of, you know, set in stone. Um, or maybe, frankly, there's, you know, new strategies that are kind of looking at and saying, actually, because we need to be more agile, this is the direction we go in. So um, I'd love to, to kind of get everyone's perspective on this. Nicole, I'll start with you. Maybe, um, you know, what is that risk reward and specifically addressing kind of what is that next big problem that could literally be anything? So after what, what transpired uh, over the course of the last year, I don't, I, I'm hard pressed to think of something, uh, you know, another black swan event that, um, that would really cause us to think, hey, maybe we should avoid this sector. Um, my biggest takeaway is that we are snapping back faster than ever. You know, if you would have told me exactly a year ago that the market today is going to be where it is, I would not have believed you, right? Um, a year ago today, startups were huddling, thinking about how to cut costs, how to shed headcount, how to like hunker down and, and conserve cash. So they let people go. And nowadays they're fighting for talent. I'm hearing it left, right, and center companies of all sizes and stages are desperate for talent. And if they at the time had the foresight to say, hey, you know what? This is going to blow over. This is going to be okay. Especially us in tech lands, we're going to be fine. Let's, let's take this opportunity to hold on to our talent, to retain them. And you know what? Let's go out there and let's swoop up all the talent that's just been pushed onto the streets. But, but I they got a pushback. Did, it, are, did you tell your companies, guys, go spend money? Like everything's going to be fine. Is that really what you said? Kudos we did. To you. We did. And it, it's in writing. It's somewhere on the internet. Could I had the same perspective, by the way. I said the same thing. However, there were there were all of these posts from like major Silicon Valley investors saying, you need to cut everything. You need to like literally just saying weather the storm, shut down operations for the next two years and do your bet. Like basically like really, really kind of catastrophic, you know, naysaying. So kudos to you if that if you did have that perspective, because I think it's right. Investors correct, Anthony. Yeah, one out of every like hundred, you know, whatever. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Guy on your side, same thing? Um, well, similar, I think as uh, skills and skill sets that are gonna be required for the next generation or even just the next pandemic or just the next year are gonna be very different. So let's take, I mean, we're having a conversation. You sound very persuasive. You could have sold me something. Um, in the past, you would have taken a flight and try to you know, wear your, your best suit and try to sell me that same thing. So sales I'm still wearing my best suit, and I could have sold you remotely before anyway, too. Oh, I thought it was it was fake. Okay, so uh, uh, in this, so you know, the world is changing, and the skills of salespeople, for example, right, are very different these days, or will have to be very different the next year uh, if you want to keep selling the same way you have been, or in, just to be as present 
as you thought you are when you're flying over and shaking hands with customers. So again, technology could play a big part here, but I think it also calls for a change in the way people think about interactions between people. And I'm not going all the way to uh, VR. We know, you know that's coming at some point. Uh, so far, we, I'm not convinced that any of this is, is usable today. Uh, but maybe next year or the year after, we will be having this kind of virtual, quasi-virtual conference and have a, a feeling that we're together, even if we're in different locations. And the world is going in this direction. In general, I think that interaction between humans is something that is not being disrupted. Going back to the you know the uh, business card question, right? I think business cards have only exited our lives last year, after 150 years of people saying they should go away, right? Despite like 10 years of technology in the interim, like where people are like, killing it or sounding the death knell of it, right? Exactly. So, so I think finally maybe we're we're done with that. Though people I are doubt still it. They're coming yeah. back. I, I think office space is coming back. I think the business cards are coming back. I think the whole thing now it may not be as pronounced. And I think there will be some innovation, but realistically, you know, back to your point, Nicole, I think the companies that bought up real estate and actually like started, you know, having physical office spaces, I think that is going to become a competitive differentiator going forward too. So. Um, it, what, what, one more comment, though, on the interaction. I think uh, human interaction is also our way of gathering information. And the flow of information, I think you were related to the uh, pandemic. How do we know that something is coming? How can we protect ourselves faster, right? It has to do with how fast information travels and how could you fact check and make sure that what you're getting is actual and real. And that's a bigger problem. We're not going to deal with that. But enterprise platforms allowing the flow of information and a little bit of the, the soft kind of informal communication to actually persist, even if we're remote, I think is very important. My wife, for example, she, she's a program manager in a large technology company. She says she has lost her, her kind of uh, superpower. Her superpower was chatting up people, yep. figuring out what's what's wrong and you know where are we uh, delaying the product, right? El elbow conversations, grab somebody exactly. by the elbow that, right after that a meeting. And say, hey, just wanted to check on this. And those are so important, they're gonna come back. I mean, the past two. Exactly. But technology should be helpful with that, yeah. Alan, same question for you. Um, and, and I think this will probably be the last thing we have time for. Um, you know, as you look at, and, and obviously no one could have predicted that in-store shopping would have shut down, uh, you know, or that we'd be in a, a global pandemic. Um, what are the things that you are doing to future-proof the organization against that next black swan event? What are the areas that you're avoiding uh, as you think about kind of that, you know, next future? Well, I, mean, I think the the, you know, the company um, you know went through this very well. I mean, it was it was a uh, in, in fact we're we're we've seen online ordering pick up dramatically. We've seen um, as stores open, people want to get back out in stores. You know, and 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 so we're seeing human nature come back and being very resilient, and 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 not necessarily everything's going to stay the way it was during the pandemic, but. I think that what in, in general what's happening is there's a a, a new appreciation and, and HDM's already always had is one of the reasons I went there for social responsibility. I think a lot of corporations learned a lesson the hard way that you have to become more socially responsible. I know one large company that uh, was planning to be back in its offices May 1st and started bringing people back into the offices May 1st and, and really pretty much try, ignored a lot of the warnings that were coming on about people congregating together and all of a sudden people started getting sick and it's because they they didn't they didn't realize where they were in a social responsibility state and they were more worried about how getting back to how things used to be so i think the lessons learned coming out of this is that there is no such thing as i used to be and and will be again that that every organization needs to find its own way that technology needs to be start looking at being more fragmented which is a good thing in many cases and being very much uh, decentralized and, and pushing to the edge, not just technically, but to the edge where the people are and becoming much more responsive and proactive and serving the needs of the people. So I look at this as huge opportunities. I've, see, I've met a lot of entrepreneurs that see things similar to I do and are creating some fantastic things that may take a year or two to really take off, but they're going to take off and it's going to put us all in a better place in how to deal with, with these changes and these catastrophic changes from a societal standpoint as well. I, I love that the relationship between the employee and the firm and the and the responsibility from a, a you know uh, a well being perspective I think has fundamentally changed. And I think there are companies that are doing a good job and I think there are companies doing a poor job. 
Um, you know, as you look at the mental health of people who have to be inside all day, the erosion of boundaries of like working time and hours and, you know, locations and everything else, I think that it's really going to be a big competitive differentiator going forward. And I, I hope that more people land on the side that you do, uh, by all means. I, I hope so. I think there's, there's a lot of companies out there that talk a good game, but they actually don't play it. Yeah. And there's a lot of companies that we're seeing that are actually playing the game and, and, and are now can talk about it and help others. And, and then I, unfortunately, um, it's, it's many of the legacy companies that are not, uh, are not keeping up in the, in, in the way of the future of the world and, and they're stuck in their policies and processes. Again, H&M was completely the opposite of that. And that's why I, I decided to join them is because of their beliefs and the, the purpose and the values. And it paid off because it, it really paid off for the employees and the customers and everybody going through the pandemic. Well, I certainly look forward uh, to what's to come uh, from uh, H&M and from you, Alan, and certainly from Guy and, and DTCP and, and Nicole and Ibex. Um, really, really interesting. Appreciate the conversation. I can't believe it's already been an hour. It flew past. Uh, I could easily do this for, uh, for all day. Um, we will be uh, actually hosting our CIO Summit in September. Uh, I forget the exact date, but it's at uh, LandmarkCIOSummit.com. I'm sure you all will be there, if not in person, certainly, certainly virtually, uh, and uh, we look forward to welcome welcoming everyone again then. Um, but uh, really appreciate the time and energy and, and thank you all for taking time out of the busy day to, to join us in conversation. Uh, thanks, guys. Be well. Thanks, thank you. Nicole, bye.